motion to adjourn from executive session. It's been moved and second to adjourn from executive session at 7.30 p.m. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Next is approval of the agenda. Uh, I would move to remove item A from the confirmation purchase distributor. So and otherwise approve the agenda. And otherwise approve the agenda. Second. So it's moved and seconded. We're taking off the first proclamation since our sister city delegation was unable to make it here. Thanks to JFKU, of course. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the agenda as amended indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? So we'll move to proclamations. First one, whereas excellence in education is vital to the success of our city, and in Oxford we seek to instill each child and adolescent with a good education, and whereas by preparing our students for the responsibilities and opportunities of the future, education develops the intellect through lessons on literacy, math, and science. And whereas the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, dedicated his life to the betterment of mankind and tirelessly advocated for a better education for all Americans. And whereas the Rebbe taught that education should not be limited to the acquisition of knowledge and preparation for a career, but also on character building with emphasis on the universal moral and ethical values that are the basis of any peaceful, civilized society. And whereas the United States Congress has established Education and Sharing Day USA as an annual national day to commemorate the Rebbe's achievements and the lessons and the vision he set forth are relevant to us all today. Now, therefore, I, William B. Snavely, Mayor of the City of Oxford, Ohio, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 12th, 2022, as Education and Sharing Day in the City of Oxford and call upon educators, volunteers, and citizens to reach out to young people and work to create a better, brighter, and more hopeful future for all. And I would invite you. I'm Yossi Greenberg. I'm the local rabbi in town. And I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank the council. I want to thank Heather. It's an honor and privilege to come here every year around this time for the Education Day and uh, for the Education Day proclamation. I had a meeting today with the superintendent, and I'm happy to share that uh, we are in talks uh, to actually uh, bring this uh, theme past just the Chabad and the Jewish community here in town, but to implement and uh, get some ideas going uh, for our youth here in the community, so we're excited about that. I want to start, because it's uh, Education and Shearing Day, with uh, the Pushka, the charity box I brought from my house, and start with an act of goodness. I want to take just one minute of your time and talk about the Rebbe. This year we're celebrating 120 years. The Rebbe was born 120 years ago in a city called Nikolaev in the Ukraine. They changed the N to the M, and that's the name you're hearing on the media, you're hearing on the news. It's called Mikolaev today. The Rebbe eventually moved to a city called the Nipro. You're hearing that name in the news as well. In 1941, the Rebbe came to America and established his court and Chabad headquarters in New York. And the rest is history. There's Chabad centers all over the world, including right here in Oxford. And myself, and my family, and the community, we're happy to be here for the last nine years, and we're very thankful to the Oxford community. So welcoming to us, Chabad and the Jewish community here, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Whereas on April 22nd, 1970, United States Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin and Dennis Hayes organized the first nationwide day 
devoted to environmental awareness and education that was celebrated by an estimated 20 million Americans. And whereas this day of environmental awareness and education is celebrated worldwide in some 180 countries with the participation of over 4,000 separate organizations, and whereas individuals and institutions have a mutual responsibility to seek ecological, economical, and ethical choices that enable the world, as well as our individual communities, to establish and maintain sustainable societies. Now, therefore, I, William B. Snavely, Mayor of the City of Oxford, Ohio, do hereby proclaim that on Thursday, April 22nd, 2022, the City of Oxford will recognize and participate in the national and international celebration of Earth Day. I urge all citizens to celebrate Earth Day and remind each person of their right and responsibility to the wise use of this global home to heal, preserve, and improve the Earth and the quality of life for this and future generations and to approach every day as Earth Day. And I don't believe anyone from the Environmental Commission is here to discuss it, so let's move to the so. Can I just say one little word on that? Just that Please. later we'll be talking about our climate, our um, uh, council priorities, and I think it's notable that one of our top three is climate and sustainability. Um, I think more than proclamations, we're really serious about it, and a recent New York Times headline was, stopping climate change is doable, but time is short. So um, I believe we are as serious as we can hope to be. So um, yeah, we have a proclamation and we're doing more. We are doing more. I was going to mention that, and I also appreciate the number of people who have stopped me recently in our neighborhood to say, hey, how are those solar <laughs> panels working on your house? I see those solar panels. Um, I even got my, my bill today for from Duke Energy, and it was $17. You're kicking butt in sunny spring weather. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Um, next, we have a presentation on deer impacts with by David Gorchoff. Chair of the Miami University Natural Areas Committee. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dave Gorchov. I know a lot of you. I'm a 30 year resident of uh, Oxford. Um, and today I'm uh, coming to you as the chair of the Miami University Natural Areas Committee. And I just want to uh, introduce the idea of uh, the university has of managing the deer population on the university's natural areas. Uh, we have about a thousand acres of uh, natural areas on the Miami campus. Uh, a lot of paved trails, they're used by city residents as well as Miami students. Uh, the recently uh, paved uh, Oxford Area Trail that goes from Heifer Park through Western Woods and is connecting uh, on the other side of uh, Route 73 uh, past the DeWitt Cabin to uh, Bonham Road. Virtually all of that is Miami University Natural Areas and the extension that will go uh, from Heifer Park up to the high school, almost all of that is Miami Natural Areas. So it's a resource for the city as well as for the university. Uh, White-tailed deer are uh, native throughout much of North America, but they have been increasing a great deal. Uh, this is sort of a reconstructed population estimate for the state of Ohio, where they were virtually extinct uh, uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, they've continued to become more abundant since the years on this particular graph. I show this picture uh, to show a browse line that deer in a lot of areas are so abundant. They're sort of eating everything they can and the vegetation that's left is what is not edible to them or not reachable. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of reasons we're concerned about this in the natural areas. Um, the main one that I'm gonna focus on uh, 
is the effect of deer eating the seedlings of trees. Uh, the fewer seedlings are, the fewer that can potentially replace the large trees when they eventually fall. And that's the forest regeneration is impaired. And in some cases, this can even cause what's called a uh, trophic ricochet. So the idea is we've lost the natural predators of the deer. So the deer are here as ungulate herbivores. They become abundant. We lose the tree seedlings, which means there's going to be fewer larger trees. We have fewer herbivores like insects, and that can affect insect-eating birds. And so this has been documented uh, elsewhere. We haven't documented this part in the Miami natural areas, but we're concerned about it. Uh, this picture is a seedling of a buckeye tree with a blue notebook behind it, and it's just really stunted. It's been browsed so many times. It keeps re-sprouting and branching and getting browsed back. It's probably a pretty old tree, but it's very small, just as an example of this sort of high deer pressure. Uh, my colleague Tom Christ, who's now the chair of the biology department, has supervised some graduate students that have done estimates of the abundance of deer in different natural areas. These are five of our different natural areas compared to the three parts of Houston Woods State Park. The method actually involves uh, counting deer fecal pellet piles and doing some calculations from those. Uh, so there's a lot of numbers here. The number we're comparing to is uh, eight deer per square kilometer, which is 20 deer per square mile. Above that is generally considered a problem, too many deer that are causing negative effects. In a lot of our natural areas, it's above that. Our biggest natural area, Bachelor Preserve, it's well above that. Uh, so this makes us think that deer are too abundant. Uh, back in 2010, Tom and I set up a series of deer exclosures. These are fenced areas. Some of them, actually all of them, are visible from Miami University uh, Natural Areas trails. Uh, they're 20 meters on the side, so about 65 feet on the side. Uh, and each one is paired with a plot that started out being very, very similar in, in location and vegetation, but we haven't fenced, so that's our deer access plot. And so the yellow dots here are the locations in the natural areas uh, here's Western Woods, here's the Bachelor Preserve. Uh, the yellow are our deer exclosure locations and the purple are the deer access plots. Uh, we're also interested in the effect of, uh, of bush honeysuckle. So in half of each plot we removed honeysuckle. And we've gotten a lot of scientific papers out looking at the effects. I'm just going to show you a couple of things. Uh, this is a graph of tree seedlings, and by tree seedlings we're talking about trees that are between 0.3 and 2 meters tall, so between about 1 foot and about 6.5 feet tall. And I don't have data from 2010 when we set this up, but in 2015, uh, Christina Hafey, an honor student, census then, and we started to see more seedlings where deer were excluded and we'd remove the honeysuckle, but it was still quite low overall. And my master's student, Marco Donoso, last summer recensed all of these. And the numbers of tree seedlings is recovering wherever we've excluded deer, particularly where we've also removed honeysuckle. And it's still very low where the deer still have access. Uh, deer affect lots of other things. I'm only going to show you one other effect because it's uh, kind of a cascading effect. Deer, it turns out, promote non-native earthworms. And most of our earthworms here are Eurasian earthworms. And they're good for gardens, but in the forest they create this bare ground. They eat the fallen leaves, and the ground is bare early in the summer. And this makes it uh, easy for garlic mustard and other invasive annuals and biennials to germinate and grow. And my current honor student, Hannah Leonard, has documented that where deer have access, you have a lot more bare ground than where the deer are excluded. Um, so there's other effects, but this is just to show you why we're concerned. These natural areas, we're trying to keep them relatively useful, uh, functioning ecological system, and the deer are greatly impairing that.
Uh, as I imagine all of you know, the uh, City of Oxford has had a very successful deer management program since 2009 using bow hunting in designated areas. And uh, David Trelevin, who's, who's been monitoring that, managing that, he's been on an ad hoc committee that the natural areas has had to look into what we can do on campus. And he's been very helpful. And a lot of what we're thinking of doing is modeled on what the city of Oxford is doing. Uh, so the natural areas committee, uh, at this point, uh, we're drafting a deer management plan for the natural areas. Uh, we want to include bow hunting for the same reason the city has used bow hunting. Uh, we would do this in the winter. The archery season is actually late September to early February. We're thinking late November to early February. There's not much use of the trails uh, at that time. Uh, we would obviously coordinate with the city, and my being here today is the first step in that. Uh, we would need to coordinate with Oxford Township, because it turns out some of our natural areas are actually in Oxford Township. Uh, so that's on my agenda. Uh, we're going to reach out to the property owners who border the natural areas and let them know what we're doing and give them an opportunity to give us feedback. Uh, and we're going to have uh, public meetings. We're going to have one scheduled for May 5th. That's a Thursday evening. We'll do it online through Zoom. Uh, we will be inviting uh, members of the um, Oxford City community and I guess Oxford Township and so uh, I may talk to Jessica about ways to reach out to city residents um, as well as Miami students and staff and faculty members and have a meeting where we'll present our management ideas and get input that we'll consider before we uh, finalize any plan. Uh, this email will um, come to me and come to uh, Nancy Peets, who's standing over here. She's the manager for the Miami Natural Areas. So if anyone has questions about the natural areas, deer related or not, they can just email that and we will uh, both see that. So I'm glad to answer any questions you have at this time. And to let you know, we will be reaching out to, um, to the citizens uh, of Oxford and Oxford Township about this. Thank you. Anyone have questions? Jason. Two sure questions. Um, did you mention whether we know whether there's stable populations for all these species? Uh, did you ask whether the deer population is stable currently? Yeah. Um, uh, we have estimates from 2014 and from 2017 are the only two estimates, and they're pretty similar. So it's probably over that period, and currently it's pretty stable. Uh, I think it's much more than it was 30 years ago when I came, and much more than it was probably 15 years ago. Yeah. But we don't we don't have hard data on that. Yeah, I, I want to thank you. I know that I've been really grateful that the city has been doing this, and I think it has made a, a, a big difference. I was recently shown a video of a herd of deer in Amber's neighborhood that was probably 16 deer, 18 yeah. deer. So, I mean, I think it's good. I wonder whether we're doing enough because I love the deer, but I really worry for our forests. Um, so I think this is a great first step. I hope we can coordinate. Um, have you looked at other options other than the model of both? I mean, other communities use other professional management. Mm -hmm. um, so is this the, the strategy you're looking at right now, or are there other things you would potentially consider? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, park systems and so on that have dealt with this problem. We've uh, looked very carefully at Hamilton County Parks plan, um, the city of Cincinnati park system, they uh, do deer management, they both do bow hunting. Um, there's a few other college campuses, we've got their plans, uh, Binghamton is the one that comes to mind, uh, they do bow hunting. Uh, uh, sharpshooters have been used in some cases. The uh, Hamilton uh, County Parks, I, uh, if I recall correctly, initially started with that and quickly switched to uh, bow hunting. Uh, any kind of uh, gun hunting, whether it's sharpshooters or individual hunters, raises concern about gunshots in the city limits and people are concerned. Um, 
Bow hunting's a lot safer. The a bow does not travel as far as a stray bullet. We'll have, we probably will have the hunters in, in fixed locations and stands. So if they miss, the arrow goes into the ground. So it's uh, very safe. Um, one thing that the city of Cincinnati is doing in a couple of the very small, very urban parks is a sterilization program, which is extremely expensive. Uh, it's very tricky. You need to capture and euthanize the deer. You need veterinarians. You need a little surgical uh, setup. Um, and then, you know, those deer wander out and other non-sterilized does wander in. So uh, we did some thought about other management. At this point, we're focused on bow hunting. Okay. NCR recently covered the covered deer population and in terms of life-saving measures because of the amount of car accidents that happen. Um, and they were looking at places that were national parks like Yellowstone and what they did compared to a populated place like the state of Wisconsin. Um, and they had estimated in Wisconsin what they were doing was allowing wolves to come back in. Mm -hmm. This is harder like in a campus type situation. <laughs> um, but it was really fascinating because they were talking about how um, the different policies of different states and the estimation of how many lives it saves, if we can reduce the amount of accidents that happen, um, and sa saving about $11 million a year. Um, so I think it's really interesting. And there was a friend who taught me about permaculture and that there's never too much of anything. If anything, there's too little of something else. So because, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, <laughs> but because we have gotten rid of all their natural predators, we now have this problem. So, so much of it is self-manifested that, you know, how can we try to return to a more natural balance? And the story also covered that the, the average age of hunters is they're middle-aged. Mm -hmm. So there's a dynamic that could be changing as generations go by. Yeah, those, those are really good points. The, the Wisconsin situation is interesting because wolves have been moving on their own from Canada into Minnesota and Wisconsin and are expanding uh, on their own with any, without any sort of active promotion uh, by any wildlife agencies. And there's a lot of researchers kind of following what's happening to the ecosystems as the wolves reestablish. Uh, but you're right, not only have we eradicated the natural predators here, we provide corn and soybeans ad lib, and the deer are, in a lot of places, are major crop pests. And so in late summer and early fall, yard. they have a lot of food. We plant our gardens, and they have, it's they like have a food buffet. from them. We have a lot of edge habitat, and deer thrive with edge habitat. Um, so we've enhanced the food supply. Um, and then, you know, the issue of hunters, in addition to the demographic uh, point you made, in general, there's, you know, no hunting in city limits, and there's no hunting in residential areas, so there's a lot of areas, even if there were interested hunters, where deer have sanctuary and, and aren't hunted. So one of the things that we're looking at, because a lot of our natural areas are adjacent to some of these areas the city has already designated, as hunting areas of sort of coordinating, selecting our specific hunting spots wisely so that they sort of reinforce what the city is attempting to do. Um, and we'll be monitoring, so we'll be not only counting how many deer are taken, but are we seeing better survival of tree seedlings? Are we seeing fewer deer fecal pellet piles? And, and so on, to see if, if we're having an effect. Will there be signage? And yes. To warn people off that this is a hunting season. Um, there will be signage of some sort. We, um, I'm just we, we may or may not want to close trails. That's mm -hmm. one thing we, to be decided. We may or may not want to say, this week there is a hunter on this trail. We, that may be, in the end, undesirable uh, to do that. Right. So there will be a general signage of during these dates... Uh, there is hunting, but uh, um, the other thing is we would make sure there was no that the the stands were not close to the trails, right? And we already are telling people stay on the trails, yeah. so that'll that'll. We help. do that with western knolls, for example. 
the tree stands are pointing away from the residential areas for that very reason. Okay. Um, I also, uh, maybe two years ago, I read an article about a research article about that was done on Yellowstone and the reintroduction of the wolves in Yellowstone and amazing kinds of impacts that they didn't anticipate, mm -hmm. but as it folds down, effect over effect over effect, and the entire ecosystem was enhanced by that. And I was turned on to that by a former Oxford resident who now lives in Montana, who follows the wolves in Yellowstone. So I don't think we're gonna reintroduce yeah. wolves in, in Oxford, although I heard a rumor there was a bear. <laughs> but I do think that uh, these kinds of programs are very important, and so uh, I think you have councils. And I would ask that we continue to collaborate. I mean, I think you're already doing so. Collaborations. I would, I would love to see increased harvest rates within the city. I mean, I think, I, I don't know what a number that we aim at is for a healthy deer population, but I think we can collaborate and aim towards that number together, and whatever it takes to, yeah. in terms of hunter recruitment, or just, I think we can do more in the city, and I hope we do that with from a, from a policy perspective, maybe not reintroducing wolves per se, but <laughs> um, thinking about ways to educate people that maybe wolves aren't such a bad thing, or if we had different policies that maybe, like in Arizona, they pay people to have wolves if they have proof of wolves on their property so they can change the way they manage their land. Um, and if you need veterinarians, if you do go in for the sterilization, I know some people <laughs> that have tranquilizers, so I think that we could make that happen. Do coyotes? Koi wolves, they have koi wolves. They don't take, they don't take down deer. That's too bad because we yeah. have coyotes. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank for you. You. Okay, at this time we will entertain public comments. So anyone wishing to address council about items not on the agenda or on the consent agenda, please come forward now and state your name and address for the record and we'll give you up to 15, up to five minutes. <laughs> Almost said 50. I was giving him 50. I will give you up to five minutes to talk our ears off. Seeing no takers. We will move to the consent agenda. Can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. It's been moved Second. by Vice Mayor Chantel Ragu and seconded by Councillor French. Are there any items to be removed? Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. I will move then to resolutions. You may read the first one. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Jackson Construction Company for the construction and replacement of designated curb, gutter, and sidewalk pre-project specifications at a cost of $125,271 plus a contingency in the amount of $24,729 for a total not to exceed $150,000. May we have a motion to adopt the resolution? So, second. It's been moved and seconded. And Mike, we're happy to have you back. Good evening, thank you. Uh, this is the second of four pieces of legislation that is required for this uh, curb gutter sidewalk assessment program. So in February, Council approved a resolution of necessity, which uh, allowed us to send certified letters to property owners to have work completed. And this resolution is for a construction contract to get the work done. Uh, the work will be completed uh, hopefully by July. So we need to get this done in advance of our uh, road resurfacing program. So this resolution is uh, somewhat similar to the next one as they both involve uh, the lowest and best bid by Jackson Construction. And uh, they both involve uh, concrete, curb gutter, sidewalk, and handicap ramps. So we've worked with Jackson Construction before on several contracts and they do a good job for us. And they gave us 
a very good pricing. Uh, you'll see we only received two bids where normally uh, we would expect five, six, seven, or eight bids uh, for this type of work. So contractors are busy. Uh, some of the good ones, other than Jackson, uh, may not be able to meet our deadline. They're already committed on other jobs. So the market is tight for this type of work. So uh, we recommend approval of this contract and be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Seeing none, council discussion. I had a few questions. I'm just curious. When you see such a big difference between two bids, what, what is the what what accounts for that wide a difference? I can speculate if you'd like my personal opinion. Yeah. Uh, as far as speaking for Pruce, they are a wonderful contractor. Uh, they're very large. They're very busy. Uh, they are the contractor for the Main Street reconstruction project that will be going on this summer. And I suspect that they put in this bid hoping maybe that there weren't any others and they would have a very, very profitable contract while they're already in town. So I, I believe that's why that price might be higher. Okay. Our, our bid tabs for that company are typically lower. Uh, unit pricing is lower than what was submitted for this one. Okay, and then the other question I had is that the contingency is 19.7%. And then when I looked at the contingencies for the other resolutions we have coming up, they're much lower. How do you decide what the contingency is gonna be um, project by project? So typically we ask for 10% for unforeseen conditions in a job, especially when there's underground work involved. Uh, in this case, we're asking for the full budget line item amount uh, so that we can improve not only the property owners for the street paving program, uh, but also go after our uh, complaint file where property owners with dangerous uh, sidewalk sections have not improved their work. And so this extra money will be used to uh, repair those areas and assess the property owners for the charges. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hearing none, um, all those let me get, all those in favor of the resolution indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. And we can have the second one read when we're ready. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Jackson Construction Company for the installation of handicap ramps with tactile dome mats set forth on Exhibit A and B attached here to at a cost of $105,880.80 plus a contingency amount of $2,791.20 for a total cost not to exceed $108,672. Is there a motion to adopt this resolution? So moved. Been moved by the vice mayor. Second. Second. Seconded by Councilor French. So over a year ago, City Council authorized us to apply for this community development block grant, and this is for 2021 program dollars from uh, Housing and Urban Development. So this, uh, for HUD to approve this money, generally comes later in the year, and. That's why we're following up in the following calendar year with a project. So uh, this is for our 2021 dollars. Uh, we've been doing this program for uh, over a decade now, improving handicap ramps where there were none in the city sidewalk system. Uh, this particular contract will get us almost 1,000 feet of new curb and gutter, uh, 3,600 feet of new sidewalk, square feet, and 31 new Dome, domed mats with the new handicap ramps. So again, this is uh, the lowest and best bid from Jackson Construction. And in this case, uh, the bid uh, almost met the line item amount. So we only have about a 2% contingency with this contract, but we wanna spend every HUD dollar that's available. So that's why we're asking for the full amount in this case. And how close are we to completing the handicap program, I mean, the ramp program. 
So uh, there will be another agenda item tonight, and uh, with about $200,000, we can finish uh, the rest of the ramps in the city. Thank you. So we'll be asking your approval for that later this evening. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this item? Seeing none, council, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? This resolution is adopted. May we defer? A resolution of council directing staff to advertise a request for bids to complete the installation of sidewalk ramps throughout the city using American Rescue Plan funds. So, so council has motion. authorized. I need a motion to adopt. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Thank you. Now it's your chance. The city council approved staff to uh, apply for 2022 CDBG dollars and the target project for that is the College of Elm project. Uh, so that, has, that application has been submitted. We're still waiting to hear back to get the approval for that, but I'm sure that's forthcoming. Uh, at the time when we decided to do that application, uh, it was discussed uh, using the American Rescue Plan Act funds available to the city to complete the uh, entire city network and get all of the improvements done in one project. Uh, we will likely get better unit pricing uh, for that because it will be a, a larger contract. Uh, but really this resolution is to affirm that council desires to use those funds in this manner and if so we will uh, develop the final spec package and get that out to bid. Hopefully that, uh, that work would be done uh, during the summer period when there's a lot less traffic and, and students in town. Good idea. Be glad to answer any questions. Okay, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this? There isn't, so anyone from council? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. Move to resolution four. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Baby, sorry, Barrett Paving Materials Incorporated for the 2022 street resurfacing and maintenance work at a cost of $422,263.50 plus contingency in the amount of $12,736.50 for a total cost not to exceed $435,000. Is there a motion to adopt a resolution? So moved. It's been moved and Second. seconded by Councilor French. Mike? This is our, <coughs> me, this is our uh, annual street maintenance project. It includes street resurfacing, uh, maintenance, bike and pedestrian safety, and new traffic control markings throughout the city. We advertised for bids and uh, received three bids for this project, with Barrett being the low bidder. Uh, we've worked with Barrett on numerous uh, uh, contracts in the past. They're an excellent contractor and very pleased to have them uh, submit the low bid. Uh, we did look at the streets that were paving to see if any could be improved uh, to be more compliant with our complete streets policy. And we will be installing uh, permanent thermoplastic markings on McGuffey Avenue, uh, which are already painted for bike lanes, but we will be installing permanent thermoplastic markings on that street. Uh, we were disappointed with the unit costs on the contract with the price of oil. Uh, paving is very dependent on, on oil for asphalt and tr transportation. And we saw prices rise 32% just over last year's unit pricing. Uh, so in this case, we're able to do uh, all of our uh, streets listed on Exhibit A, but we are not able to do the alternates just as a, as a matter of limited funding. Uh, in this case, we do ask for a uh, small contingency. There's about 3% uh, left in the budget line item uh, after the base contract. So we ask for your approval. 
for this contract with Barrett Pavement. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this resolution? Seeing none, Councilor. Just one um, question for you, Mike. Um, the, the, you're going to finish up that section of Contreras. That there was the rail. There a lot of work has happened on that Contreras Road, Lynn to Lynn to Locust. Um, how long do you anticipate there'll be a closure there? Um, you know, we're sensitive to because we only have so many of those. Great I'm, I'm not sure we'll, we'll do our best to maintain traffic on that so I don't know that there'll be a closure uh, if there is it will be brief okay. and then just to follow up on that I know at the parking and transportation advisory board we recognize that for alternative modes those those few crossings are also important and and it was limited in the right of way but I think that I can't remember what the exact recommendation was that some form of at least shared road signage or markings on the street so to indicate do you have a, an idea of what how you might be able to accommodate the alternative modes in that segment there. I think uh, typically we'll do that later in the year when we see how our budget lands and, and what funds are available. Okay. And we'll uh, restock on marking paint and signage. And uh, I know we have one, one pair of uh, rapid flash beacons in stock. We'll evaluate you know, where, where we can most impactfully uh, place those devices. Okay, so those are budgeted separately as opposed to, for example, like the thermoplastic for McGuffey is coming out of the paving budget versus the alternative, or is it come, where's? So we're using three, three line items to complete okay. this contract. Uh, the street resurfacing line, bike and pedestrian safety, and crack sealant for pavement maintenance. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think whatever happens on Linn, it would at most probably be like a shared use, it was some signage, but I just didn't know I'm where sure the money would come Any other discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the resolution is adopted. We'll move to number five. A resolution accepting the insurance bid of Insurance Specialist Group Incorporated, DBA, Love Insurance Partners for the city's property and casualty insurance coverage for 2022. Okay, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Been moved. Second. And seconded by Councillor Franklin. Uh, Joe, welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is our annual renewal for our uh, property and casualty insurance. And uh, the renewal came in at 190.043. And this is an increase in $21,647 over last year's cost of 168396 And Two years ago, we signed up with Asset Works, and they do a, a revisit, revisit our property listing every year, and they'll adjust it for uh, inflation. And as you know, last year the cost of building materials went sky high, so it, fifteen thousand is a twenty-one thousand dollar increase, which is about sixty-nine point seven percent just has to do with the appraisal cost. And again, we signed up for a five year, they'll do a reappraisal or a, a snapshot of the appraisal for five years going. So if prices do go down, then that will be rep represented in years coming. And just to give you an idea, in 2017, we didn't have a rate increase. We had a 1% in 2018. Three uh, percent premium decrease in 2019. In 2021, it was no increase at all, and in uh, or 2020 was no increase at all. In 2021, it actually went down uh, five thousand one hundred sixteen dollars. So, if you back out the amount that the fifteen thousand Ninety dollars from uh, the total of that went up. It the remainder is six thousand five fifty seven, which is a three point nine percent increase, which is for the inflation rate that's pretty good. But when you compare it to in twenty twenty, since we had a decrease in twenty twenty one, it's only a thousand four hundred and forty one dollars more than it was in nineteen or two thousand twenty. Excuse me. So. 
inflation is affecting everything and insurance is one of the one of the uh, culprits that's going to be affected by inflation at these times. Thank you, Joan. Would anyone from the public like to address this resolution? Seeing none, counselors, any questions? This is just unrelated exactly to insurance, but thinking about, we're looking at a number of things that are, that are getting more expensive rapidly, yet the city is primarily our financial foundation is on income taxes and incomes have not gone up or not going up as fast. So, you know, I, I this mean we're gonna be making some tough choices in, or, you know, I mean, this is just one evidence of it, but the paving contracts, everything, um, yeah. Yeah, until things get straightened out and nothing, since I've been doing this since 2001, used to have ebb and flows and it's pretty, and now nothing is normal, so it's really hard to say, especially after COVID. And it's hard to say what's going on anymore. I mean, I don't like even like our investment income probably won't. It'll never probably see at least as long as I work what it was coming in at in the early 2000s. It was like four or five percent you could get on return on investment. So you can't even depend on that anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else? Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Resolution is adopted. And we finally get to number six. <laughs> A resolution accepting the priorities, vision, and values of the 2022 measurable goals. Is there a motion to adopt this resolution? So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? <laughs> Thank you. And Jessica, we we'll welcome you. Good evening. My computer is taking a minute to wake up, and I have a small presentation, I hope. Uh, pause. Good evening. Um, I wanted to follow up after our council retreat um, for the public to be aware of what we spoke about and also kind of just formally adopt um, some of our decisions during that council retreat. So I'm going to go this pretty quickly and then after tonight I will post all of this um, as an article online for our public but I wanted to do this in this format first. So at the council retreat, um, council indicated that they wanted to recommit to their top three priority areas of climate sustainability, economic development, and housing for everyone. We also then spoke about um, a redraft of visions and values because we as department staff realized that some of the things we work on didn't really have like a place to live as a goal. And we wanted to share our progress and what we were working on, but needed a kind of a reporting structure for that. Things like where did Amtrak live? Where did um, the trail live? You know, projects like that. So we came up with um, some new suggestions. One is sense of place. Oxford is proud of what makes us unique and engages in the community to celebrate and expand our strengths. And the goal areas under that would be creative placemaking, historic preservation and public art. We had quality of life. Oxford is a safe and welcoming, attractive place to live that strives to provide equal access to high quality city programs and services. This includes education, housing, public safety, recreation, and transportation goals. Stewardship are efforts to build an Oxford for future generations. And under here you have categories of climate sustainability, economic development, fiscal responsibility, health and equity, and town and gown relationships. And finally, we have the category of service excellence that the city hires professional staff, values transparency in our processes, and provides high quality core services. And this includes infrastructure, communications and public access efforts, and human resources. Then what we as staff did is we took um, all of the things that we work on and created measurable goals and these would be things that we want to share with council um, and we will keep track of them quarterly 
And what we did is then ask council, what's missing? What do we need to add to this? And there were a few items that council kind of indicated during that retreat that they really wanted to see added to this list. So I'm gonna take a minute and kind of show you the highlights reel, not the whole thing, cause it's really long. Um, but give me just a minute to pull that up. So this will be available to the public. Um, and it is all of the measurable goals that we have created. And you could see here that they're structured by this new vision and value category, and then the goal area, the department which is responsible. We have, you know, the objective, like what are you trying to do? How are you going to do it? And what does success look like and by when? And then our goal is to then report this to you um, each quarter. What I did is I, there's a lot here, and you know, if you really, if you're like me and you get geeky, you could have this in front of you on your desk, <laughs> and it's so fun to look at. But I, what I did was I took the top three priority areas, and I showed what staff are going to be doing this year to try to really work toward those top priorities. So under climate, you can see that we have these goals established, which is to create a climate action plan in line with a global covenant of mayors. We will look at um, the, an, an EPA grant for electric vehicle charging stations. We're going to look at solar powered flare installation um, for passive methane at the closed landfill. We're going to um, look to identify initiatives to reduce our own carbon footprint in our own departments. We're going to look at um, some water production improvements and then continue on the design of the solar facility. Under economic development, we have quite a few here, um, but you know, we have things, I won't go to all of them, but we have things like encourage revolving loan fund use, um, explore workforce housing program, work to develop creative placemaking activities. And these ones with the red stars um, below are the three that um, council asked us, you know, I called it this, the pivot and squeeze. Um, and so what we did as staff is we reviewed these and we felt, yeah, let's just go ahead and add these in. And so we have added these in. And I wanna make it clear, that doesn't mean these things are gonna actually happen. What it means is that we're going to explore it and bring forward um, legislation for council to respond to and then see if it's, it's actually what will work out. Then under housing, we have um, I, objectives such as continue to work on that community land trust, um, research and develop a partnership with a nonprofit housing, or excuse me, a nonprofit that works on housing, work with the community cottage project. And then, you know, the um, one here we have that council wanted us to add in was to explore building height um, to encourage affordable housing. And so you'll see this year we're going to really, that's a large project, but in this year, we feel that we can review public infrastructure feasibility to talk about, okay, if we wanted to go higher, what would it take? So those are just the top priority area goals, but if anyone's like me and really likes to look, um, the big long list will be made available to the public. And then finally, kind of, um, just what uh, city council talked about a lot of other things during that retreat. I have a whole summary here that I'll put on the website, but I didn't, there's a lot, so I didn't put it on this presentation tonight, but I wanted the public to be aware that what we're doing with those other ideas is we're in a state of research right now, and we will bring those forward for the budget season saying, okay, here's the ideas we heard from you, here's what we think the budget implication will be, and then as we develop that budget process this summer, we'll build those um, ideas that you shared with us into that process. So coming soon, summer 2022, uh, will be those things that we talked about at your March retreat. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this? And you have five minutes, please give us your name and address for the record, and we welcome you. Amy, you're first. Thank you, Amy Shaman, 11, Heather Ridge Court. Um, I want to say that I very much appreciate the um, efforts that um, are being taken to have an accessible community and sidewalks that are travelable for everybody, um, and uh, it, it does make a difference. 
Um, I wanted to comment on the goals. I very much appreciate them. I think that they are great goals. I especially appreciate the focus on the housing for everyone, climate sustainability, and economic development. However, I was really surprised as I read through the materials that I saw on the website that the goals do not mention of the vision, excuse me, does not mention that we strive to have a diverse, equitable community where all can feel like they belong. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are critical for our community. I think we have seen this over the past number of years uh, in a whole variety of ways. And I understand that that's something that is a bit hard to measure because we, we aren't 100% in control of who our population is in terms of who we are. Um, however, I, I think that there, I, I invite council to come in the city to invite it to consider adding it to a value statement so that we can say who we are and that we really do look to have a community that's inclusive for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, Amy. Ann Fuhrer, uh, 1345 Dana Drive. Um, I think my question probably reflects a lack of attention on my part to um, the process that you're going through now and um, the process involved with comprehensive planning Oxford tomorrow. But I'm interested in how the process that you're using now, for instance, the retreat and the discussion, the visioning, the goals, um, is going to look similar to uh, a process in the future. Um, is the process that you've gone through now reflecting the previous comprehensive plan? Where is this kind of retreat and goal setting and opportunity for public um, input in the process that you imagine for Oxford tomorrow? Because there's been a wonderful um, laying out of the process over the last couple of years um, in putting Oxford tomorrow together, but then to see what Jessica just reported and how it reflects a retreat. Where is that component of your planning in um, the future comprehensive plan? Um, and will there be an opportunity for public input in the same kind of way in that future uh, comprehensive plan as it turns into the kinds of goals and the budgeting that you're talking about? Thank you. Thanks. Would anyone else like to address council? Jessica, do you want to respond to some of those? Those are good questions. And um, I want to clarify first to Ms. Shaman that I, I remember typing in um, equity and inclusion under quality of life, and I don't know where it's at in this version. So my apologies. Um, we did. We, we, we I did, did discuss We did that. talk about it, right? Okay, so my, my mistake, I'll make that edit. I think equity was under stewardship also. So, but I will go back and I will find it, but we'll I remember it. typing it. <laughs> and then second, um, to Ms. Year's questions, I, I think the retreat was a little later this year because of COVID, and so normally we would do a little bit more, um, you know, community input and council input before developing the goals, but by it being already in March, department heads were like, in the budget was already passed, we're like, you know what, this is what we're, this is what we're going to be proposing for this year, and then to kind of hopefully speed up their process a little bit. How it will fit into the comprehensive plan is we will continue to have re retreats and updates each year with council and staff to be like, what are our focus areas for like right now? And then yes, the goal is once we have this comprehensive plan is that everything then goes up to that larger comprehensive plan, which is a long range planning document. So once that's created, we can almost see that each year we would pull out that comprehensive plan and say, these are the big goals. How are we taking these incremental steps to get there? And then start to build these yearly action steps based on those long-term big goals. That's how I envision it happening. We're just a little lopsided while we go through the comprehensive plan process. All right. Thank you. Okay. Is there uh, any other discussion by council? Yeah. Oh, Go I was going to say, uh, Jessica, do you want to put in a plug for the public participation for the comprehensive plan <laughs> as well? Why, yes, I would. Um, on April 18th at 6 p.m., um, all are invited to come to our second public input session and really respond to some draft goals and objectives that our consultant has created based on public input. And so this is a great opportunity to be like, 
yeah, I really agree with these, and let's take these steps, or, whoa, you got it wrong. You need to fix this. And so that's really that opportunity. Don't worry if you can't make it in person. We will have additional opportunities for you to respond to that content. And that's at Oxford Bible Fellowship? It will be at the Oxford Bible Fellowship. Yes, thank you. And you'll see publication and reminders before we get there, too. Just a few things. I, to add on to what you had said, I think that where the public comment comes in is that I can guarantee every single one of the ideas council put up there came from the public from one way or another. Um, so it's definitely things that uh, all of that was kind of distillation of what we're hearing from the community as far as from the retreat part. Um, and the re this retreat was the best retreat I've had so far being on council. So I feel like Jessica got the spotlight for that. I'm sure a lot of other people helped too. So thank you for, for a really, really great one that I really felt like we were heard. Um, and then two just uh, detailed things. I had a conversation with someone from the county this morning about childcare and how we can have, because I think childcare is a need across all socioeconomic statuses. It doesn't matter who you are, you cannot get childcare. Um, it's very limited. And so from the county perspective, they're saying there is a really big black hole in Oxford that for some reason they're not really, the city is not, not the city, but the people in Oxford is not reaching out to the county to give help in starting up like um, household family run daycares. So she was kind of surprised, like how can we kind of open this gap um, or bridge that gap? And for startup costs, because I asked her where are the barriers, she said a lot of it is a startup cost. And I asked her, well, what is that? And I was shocked that it was only $2,500. Hmm. So, and that would be for a house to have up to 12 children. And so she was saying, you know, if Oxford could have 12 of those daycares, that would be a huge help. Um, so just kind of thinking about that, and if this is something that we do end up doing grants or subsidies for, I would hope that we would make a requirement that they have to accept vouchers, because this is not just to serve higher end um, families, but for everybody. And then that is also something that helps small businesses too, that what a great incubator to have more daycares. Um, and then the last thing is, I got, I'm sure all of us have, have gotten calls and texts about buying our homes from local investors. Um, and so the one that called me this past week got an earful. Um, and I told her, you're the re part of the reason why house, housing prices are going up and looking into what other communities are doing to add an extra hurdle so that you cannot have corporate investors coming in and buying up single family homes. There are models out there that other communities are doing. And so I would love to explore legislation here so that we can try to protect the housing stock we currently have. Maybe the Housing Advisory Commission can look into mm -hmm. this. Okay. So can I, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to thank Jessica and everybody who contributed to this and to, to Ms. Fuhrer, just, I mean, I think <coughs> we're, Kind of strategic planning is a thing, but it's also a process. And, and this is a relatively new one for us, at least in the time that I've been on council. And so developing the procedures and, and the models is, is something we're kind of working our way into. Yeah, it's my hope in the long term that the comprehensive plan is really authored by the people. And, and that every year we come back and we say, what does the comprehensive plan say we should be working on this year? And that we as elected officials are channeling the vibe of what we're hearing around us and, and then maybe focus on objectives in a year and mm -hmm. staff has its own kind of ideas. Um, and, and so I'm hoping, I mean, A, that people participate in the comprehensive plan because while we will update it, I think over time, like now's the time to really shape the vision. But I hope that we can work into a process where like, I mean, if we have these kind of goals, how can the public chime in other than just like chatting with us, you know, like that, that we can have some kind of transparent process on an annual basis, um, but we're working at it. And so I'm, I'm super glad of the progress that, that we're making, not only in doing things, we've always done things, but having this kind of model that's accountable and transparent, that's really, it's worth the time so that the public can see what we're doing and why we did this. All those in favor of the resolution, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution six is adopted and we'll now go to ordinances first reading and we have one. An ordinance approving a conditional use permit application 
to allow for the reestablishment of a fraternity use located at 406 East Withrow Street, Oxford, Ohio, 45056, with conditions. Okay, thank you, Sam. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, good evening. I'm bringing a Planning Commission recommendation to you tonight uh, for, uh, actually, it's a vacant building that's been vacant for a couple years. Uh, 406 East Withrow Street. You may or may not remember the Crossroads Church that utilized the building when the fraternity no longer was using it. They were in there until the pandemic uh, and then vacated the, the building. And so the fraternity uh, wants to come back into the building and uh, use uh, their building like they originally uh, were. Uh, and have because of that change of use, they're required to go through the process as if it's brand new, even though the building was built as a fraternity. So architect Scott Webb uh, carried that application forward on their behalf and uh, went through the process. Planning Commission um, didn't actually focus that much on the, uh, the details of the fraternity uh, because it was an existing building, uh, but did focus on some of the, some of the smaller items, um, parking, uh, which is not a small item to some people, obviously, um, and also signage. We don't have really detailed signage standards for fraternities, so that was discussed a fair bit based on their uh, previous signage that they did have in the building, which uh, that right was lost uh, with the vacation of the building. Uh, and then also the parking, there would be eight parking spaces required if it was a brand new building based on the number of occupants. Uh, it was waived to be reduced to what's there now uh, for the two, uh, the single wide drive, uh, with the condition that there would be a barrier put in to prevent the encroachment onto the lawn, uh, kind of keeping with the character of the mile square. So the other conditions were, uh, were carried through as staff recommendation, uh, the street trees and then the standard uh, permitting items. Uh, so that's, that's really the, uh, the summary of it. And uh, Scott is here tonight as well. Uh, so happy to answer any questions. Super. Why don't we have Scott? And then we'll go to questions. Good evening, Welcome. Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, just like to thank staff and planning commission. You know, we feel like we kind of hammered out the, the details there. Um, I'm here representing the Kappa Sigma fraternity who has been uh, at this university since the 60s and is really looking forward to coming back into their original home. Um, as we said, we appreciate uh, planning's understanding of the parking. If you're familiar with the building at all, the only place to put the parking would be in the front yard, which nobody really wanted to do. Of course, my clients would like a little bit bigger sign. Staff wanted a little bit smaller sign. I think we kind of met in the middle. And uh, so we're happy to proceed and, and We'd appreciate your recommendation and approval. So, super. Thank you. Any questions for e either of our presenters, staff, or the? I think it's pretty straightforward. I do. I have a couple of questions actually. Mm -hmm. um, one is so that you've moved the um, occupancy from 38 to 18 individuals um, in that space. How is that monitored? What, you know, sort of police to make sure that's maintained? My understanding is that that was the requested occupancy for the fraternity. Okay. Uh, so once that is set, uh, there could be a higher occupancy that would be allowed by code. Uh, so the monitoring of that actually in fraternities is done on a mo lot more regular basis than uh, typical off-campus housing. So city staff are in there three to five times a year uh, when it's vacant and when it's occupied. So if there is a code standard, if it, if it happens to be 18 is the maximum, uh, it would be it would be much more likely that city staff would be able to monitor that than it would a non-fraternity building. Uh, but I'm sure that um, Scott could probably answer the actual code as to whether that's something that is under the new code that wasn't in effect at the time, or if that's just a, a preference okay. of the uh, of the fraternity. Okay. Scott. <coughs> so thank you. It's a it's a combination of the two. Um, Fraternities are dealing with the same thing that the rest of the university population is dealing with and the people don't really like to share bedrooms anymore um, That house built in the 60s may at one time have had bunk beds and all these relatively small fraternity rooms um, Those are really not don't really qualify as doubles under the modern code. So a combination of things uh, some of the rooms have been removed in favor of uh, fewer sleeping rooms and a couple more common spaces so that reduced the occupancy the code has reduced the occupancy and then just simply the the way that the fraternity expects these kids to live so it was voluntary on all across the board thank you mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, so yeah, what, so what question I have is, it's related to when it was used by Crossroads actually before. So um, I know that churches don't pay property taxes, but when there's a combination of like a residential and a, a house of worship, how do how do the ta how does this tax structure work? The ownership did not change, so the fraternity right. maintained the ownership. So. Uh, from a property tax standpoint, I don't think there would have been any difference that would have been experienced by the public. Good question, though. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I get. I just want to put a shout out to the fraternity, which is just the fraternity organization national uh, voluntarily disbanded this unit because of behavioral issues, um, and and as a result, you know they. They, they lost whatever was grandfathered in, the size of the sign, because they discontinued these voluntarily. And I think the Planning Commission saw that, and this was historically a fraternity. They historically had a sign of a certain kind. And, and so, you know, the fact that the organization would self-police, even if it meant they had to come through all this process again, what was, I think, we thought was kind of commendable, and I think that uh, happy to see that structure occupied again, um, as it was intended. And so appreciate the way staff and work, you know, the way our process worked, I think, produced a good compromise mm -hmm. outcome. Thanks, Katie. Any other comments or questions? Okay, this will come back at our next meeting for a second reading, and at that time, we'll have motions and, and voting on it. There are no second readings, so we'll move to announcements and communications, and we'll begin with City Manager Doug Elliott. Thank you, Your Honor. I just have a few items I want to share with you. Uh, the mayor and I uh, requested that council pull the reclama proclamation excuse me, for a sister city uh, because, as we all know, our guests were unable to make it. As was stated earlier, earlier, they were stranded at JFK Airport Friday evening and were not able to secure a flight out. Uh, they looked to try to rent a, a van, a large van, because there were six of them coming to Oxford with luggage and were unable to do that. So. Uh, you know, we were all disappointed with that. Uh, we wanted to celebrate the fact that we signed a sister city agreement with them in 2017 and to show the mayor, who had has not been to Oxford, uh, our community uh, for the first time. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how well she's enjoyed her trip since she's been it in uh, New York City. It's a beautiful city. You've but seen there. JFK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so anyway, uh, and as I think uh, everyone knows, the mayor and I have been invited to visit them in June for their Twin City celebration, and we plan to do that. So uh, we'll make up for the uh, uh, fact that they were not able to come to Oxford. So that was unfortunate. Uh, also, I wanted to let the city council know and the public that, uh, as was uh, stated earlier during our retreat, one of the items that came up was to look at expanding the boundary for our Dora and making it year-round. And so uh, Jessica, JJ, uh, Seth, and I met uh, Thursday, excuse me, Tuesday a week ago to discuss our designated outdoor refreshment area. Uh, so basically we talked about extending the Dora boundary. Uh, if you remember, uh, the Dora boundary is, uh, uh, stops at uh, Elm Street and, uh, or excuse me, we, we wanted to look at extending it to Elm Street. Uh, and that would include uh, not only uh, Fon Chen, uh, the Community Arts Center, but also looking to include the uh, Caroline Harrison building. So we're looking at that. Uh, and then we also discussed making it year round. Uh, in reviewing the statute and the rules, this would require us to submit, uh, would require the city manager to submit a new application uh, to the city like we did when we established the first DORA because of the boundary change. So we talked about doing that this summer, uh, and uh, which means then uh, we would have to uh, advertise, have a public hearing, and then uh, we would present legislation to council to adopt the uh, amended DORA. So we'll do that uh, probably at the end of the summer. And the last thing that I wanted to share with city council is I did talk to Mike Everett with the hospital today uh, regarding uh, COVID cases. And uh, he said basically they currently have one COVID patient and one possible one. Uh, neither one is from the Oxford zip code, 45056. Both were over 60 years old. Uh, he also stated that looking back the past 14 days in our zip code, they provided 40 
uh, tests to community members and they've had zero positive. So yeah, things are looking good for the hospital. Uh, as you know, because I'm sure we all track that, uh, maybe not so much as we did a month ago, but cases continue to go down in Ohio. Uh, we now have, uh, as of yesterday, uh, 443 average new cases per day, and it was as high as, I think, 26,000 cases over nine, ten weeks ago. So good news for us. And I also wanted to share with you that the hospital will be offering boosters uh, for folks that are o over 50 years old and have had their uh, last booster at least four months ago. So uh, the dates are April 12th from 8 a.m. to 11.45 a.m., April 15th from 8 a.m. to 3.45 p.m., April 19th from 8 a.m. to 3.45 p.m., April 21st from 7.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. So uh, you need to contact the hospital if you're interested to book a booster. Uh, obviously, we all feel strongly, I believe, that that's the best way to uh, avoid uh, getting COVID is to get a booster shot. And uh, so that's all I have this evening, unless you have some questions for me. Yeah, Thank you. Are they, I know CDC's guidance for people under the age of 50 who receive Johnson & Johnson is also recommended to get a booster. Are they giving boosters to those people too? They're giving both Moderna and Pfizer at the hospital. But so to, to the Johnson & Johnson to anybody. people? Yeah. Yes, yes. And, okay. Yes, yes. You can find that online? Yes, I believe and, so. And uh, you can also, CVS and other pharmacies are also. Walmart and other places. Yeah. 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 yeah, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. You there? Mike? I'm here. Mike, thank you. Keith? Joe? Jessica, Sam, I finally got a taker. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for appointing the uh, Building Board of Appeals members. We had our first training tonight. Uh, the board hasn't met in 10 years, so uh, we're getting the, the rust shaken off and getting our procedures and everything set up. So we have our first hearing uh, April 20th. Uh, another item I wanted to respond to Vice Mayor uh, Rehu's uh, comments about child care. A couple data points. Uh, we do have in the zoning code a threshold of when there's more than six being cared for, there's a, there's a special process for that. Uh, so the six and under, there would not be a, a separate process just, just for general information. Uh, and also another data point, um, I do recall there was a uh, child care that was in operation up through the pandemic and then they actually closed uh, and what they informed city staff of was they had trouble getting uh, qualified staff. And so that's just kind of a general uh, thing that we see in a, in a smaller city uh, that's just an ongoing issue and so uh, that's just part of long-range planning that uh, we are continuously thinking about is how to make sure there's qualified staff for every field uh, that's that's in the area so just thought I'd share that in response thanks thank you Heather nothing thank you okay Chris uh, well uh, our, our legislature is back at it um, on this, uh, not today's issue, but on the Airbnb, uh, many of you have probably seen that the state wants to uh, try and take over uh, more home rule power by saying that municipalities cannot legislate uh, or control Airbnb. Uh, there has been a request uh, through the Ohio Municipal Attorneys Association to have councils who are troubled by that uh, legislation to uh, pass some something or adopt some measure to send to the state house so i guess my question to you is would you like me to do that and bring it to the next meeting for yes. your review and approval yes i have communicated with our local representative i doubt that it had as much impact as a resolution might have which is minimal but let's do it anyway well the one thing i would say is that uh, that unlike some measures that this one is so clearly violative of home rule powers because of uh, the, the Supreme Court's decision in the early 30s that said local municipalities have the right to zone if it's, if it's a rational basis understanding. Yes. And if Airbnb doesn't relate to local zoning, I don't know what does. And, and it creates an unequal playing field. All of our hotels and motels in this town play by a, that yeah. same set of rules. So we, I mean, we were not creating anything that was onerous by comparison to that. We were putting them on the same field. And I think we should have the right to do that. 
That's Bill's editorial for the day. <laughs> I was just going to say, in addition, these are in residential areas, so they probably not, and so they have yes. to right next to the door. Right. Thank you. It's not my pleasure. <laughs> Councilor <laughs> Ellerby. Nothing, thank you. Councilor Frank. Uh, yeah, just a quick note. Um, it was great to see, as unfortunate as it was to not be able to go to dinner with the Diffidence delegation last night, um, it did mean that I was able to watch Sean Aston virtually. Um, shout out to Rudy or Samwise Gamgee or the Goonies, wherever you know him from. Um, but I was really moved by his talk about being open with mental illness struggles and what he's experienced over time. Um, and that coalesces with a recent loss of a member of the Miami University community. Um, who was also very outspoken um, and very bravely so about her issues and her trauma and her struggles with mental health. So this is just kind of my plug. Again, if you or anybody you know is struggling, um, please you know, be brave. Follow those examples of, of others who are open and vulnerable. Talk about them. Um, don't keep it to yourself. Ask questions and get help if you need help. There is zero shame in that. And you know, spring can be a, t a tough time of year. If you're a student, you're cruising towards finals, and if you're not a student, the weather being 70 degrees one day and 30 and snowing the next day is tough. Um, so yeah, just be open, get help if you need it. Again, no shame in that. Um, and otherwise, that's all I got. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, a couple things. Thank you for bringing mm -hmm. that up, Sam, because I had a question if our zoning was maybe restricting daycares in certain ways, so I would, thank you. I would love to explore that further. Um, and I spent the day in Columbus uh, talking with state senators and meeting for AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander Advocacy Day. And one of the asks was um, to Ms. Shaman's point, um, was to ask to teach world history in K through 12. And one of the senators response was, yeah, you know, I grew up here, I was taught US history and European history. He's like, but if we give, if we give one group a unit, then we're going to have to give everyone a unit. And it just blew my mind that that was the response. So, I mean, let that sit in. If we are teaching our children about Europe and the U.S. and nobody else, what a sad, incomplete picture of our world. Um, so, if anyone wants to write to their representatives to teach world history to a K-12 student, that would be great. I just want to say how much I enjoyed the uh, marker dedication to Maurice Rocco at the Woodside Cemetery a couple of weekends ago. I want to thank staff for installing it, and um, it's another wonderful spot on the Enjoy Oxford Black History Tour. So if you have some time when the weather is better, because it was freezing <laughs> that it was day. So cold. It was so miserably cold. <laughs> um, go and visit it. It's worth visiting. So not really anything tonight, but since you brought up Airbnb, um, since I'm on the Miami Parents page, there's a very robust economy in short-term rentals in Oxford. And I'm just kind of curious, we spent a lot of time thinking about our ordinance, but I think the, that economy continues to grow and I continue to see properties converted and people going into that business uh, in contravention to our code. And so I'm not sure what our stance is going to be on that. I think that's a deep, it's, it's tough, but I think given how tough the affordability is and how inc the incredible money that's in that market, um, we may, yeah, I'm, what our enforcement stance is and uh, that maybe makes some unpopular decisions locally, but when, when, it t when it's the appropriate time to talk about it, uh, whether we want to let our support to that. I'm sure it's not anything Sam's super anxious to, to tackle, but I think it's really important You high and municipal league has also brought attention to this issue with our legislature. So it, there are a lot of people in this state talking about it. A um, couple of things. Uh, a number of people in town have been asking about, hey, did we forget about Amtrak? No, we did not forget about Amtrak. And I wanted to let you know that we're working through the issues. Uh, we've got plans that have been laid. There's as yet no major obstruction that we're aware of. Uh, we're getting a lot of cooperation. I want to 
give a shout out to Jessica for leading that effort and uh, doing a really good job of it. So we continue to meet with the powers that be and we hope that that will come to fruition. Um, secondly, um, I want to remind people that of a couple of community events. One of them is Kiwanis Pancake Day. And this is something, it's like a major opportunity to get together as a community and do something for Oxford's children. So if you know a member of the Kiwanis Club, you can get a ticket to Pancake Day, and it's a dollar cheaper than if you just show up on the day. Uh, I want to recognize the many corporate business, small business sponsors that we have in this community who have stepped up and supported this event. And uh, so find a Kiwanis member, someone like me, who has tickets, buy a ticket, go and meet your fellow uh, Kiwan, uh, fellow uh, Oxford citizens, and that is on April 23rd. So that's coming right up. Uh, and something to mark on your calendars in May is May 21st is the Wine and Craft Beer Festival. It's coming to town. So that is coming back, and, and it's another opportunity to get together with people uptown. Um, finally, um, I was... Uh, I spent time listening to President Zelensky address the United Nations Security Council, and I've seen the footage, as many and hopefully most of you have. Uh, what is going on in Ukraine could happen here. Uh, they had stable lives. They had, they had everything going smoothly as we do here, and now it's all in ruin. And... Um, I just think that we need to say an extra prayer for the people of Ukraine. And I stand with Ukraine, and I hope that my colleagues and fellow citizens do as well. With that sad note, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Been moved. Been moved. Second. And seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you.